to Fast Asleep with Gina Marie. I'm Gina, and Marie, well, can't come to the microphone right now. So, how are you? I hope you had a good week. Thank you for checking in today. Oh, don't worry, we're ready with another classic story from a classic author. Yes, it's still real literature. No, we are not going to read the Constitution backward. Some do, you know. We want to thank you also for keeping Fast Asleep with Gina Marie right here by commenting, reviewing, and subscribing. Thank you. Well, we've again tapped into the works of the beloved New England author, Sarah Orne Jewett, for today's episode. Let's see what I have on Sarah. Her novels, her poetry, three children's books, and many short stories, yes, all reflect the realistic, gentle life of Maine's coastal fishing villages. Oh, sounds quaint. Miss Jewett was born, lived, and died in her shipbuilder grandfather's home in South Berwick, Maine. And it was important to her to capture a way of life that was truly disappearing. The loneliness, the heartaches, and the joys of her people. She was a tall, very dignified, quite charming woman. And she could vividly portray women as she knew them with their inner lives and passions exposed. Oh, that is very true of today's story. One aspect of Miss Jewett's life, oh yeah, here we go, is included always in any bio written about her. And so I guess I will include it too, but I will include it in my way. Often it's said she never married, and that's not true. She was married. In fact, she had what she called a perfect partnership with the widow of her editor. She and Annie Adams Fields, also conveniently a writer, exchanged rings and vows and lived happily together, renewing those vows on each anniversary until Sarah died at age 59, too young. So this marriage idea between two women was not uncommon in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Most did take place in New England and most involved very financially secure, college-educated women. And there was a term, Boston marriage, that was applied to these marriages, but it certainly never called for the support of any man. Well, after today, if you would like more Sarah, a white heron. That's the name of her most lauded story. It's also available on Fast Asleep with Gina Marie, episode 188. So, Miss Jewett published her first story at the age of 19, and get this, was known to turn out 10,000 words in just one day. I think it's time to hear some of those words right now. Tuck in, everybody, for Sarah Orne Jewett's Marsh Rosemary. Afternoon in August, a single moving figure might have been seen following a straight road that crossed the salt marshes of Walpole. Everybody else had either stayed at home or crept into such shade as could be found near at hand, 
the thermometer marked at least 90 degrees. There was hardly a fishing boat to be seen on the glistening sea. Only far away on the hazy horizon, two or three coasting schooners looked like ghostly flying Dutchmen, becalmed for once and motionless. Ashore, the flaring light of the sun brought out the fine clear colors of the level landscape. The marsh grasses were a more vivid green than usual. The brown tops of those that were beginning to go to seed looked almost red, and the soil at the edges of the tide inlets seemed to be melting into a black, pitchy substance, like the dark pigments on a painter's palette. Where the land was higher, the hot air flickered above it dizzily. This was not an afternoon that one would naturally choose for a long walk. Oh, yet Mr. Jerry Lane stepped briskly forward and uh, appeared to have more than usual energy. His big boots trod down the soft carpet of pussy clover that bordered the dusty whitish road. He struck at the stationary procession of thistles with a little stick as he went by. Oh, flight after flight of yellow butterflies fluttered up as he passed and then settled down again to their thistle flowers. While on the shiny cambric back of Jerry's Sunday waistcoat basked at least eight large green-headed flies in complete security. It was difficult to decide why the Sunday waistcoat should have been put on that Saturday afternoon. Jerry had not thought it important to wear his best boots or best trousers and had left his coat at home altogether. <laughs> He smiled as he walked along, and once, when he took off his hat, as a light breeze came that way, oh, he waved it triumphantly before he put it on again. Mm. Evidently, this was no common errand that led him due west and made him forget the hot weather and caused him to shade his eyes with his hand as he looked eagerly at a clump of trees <laughs> and the chimney of a small house a little way beyond the boundary of the marshes where the higher ground began. Miss Anne Floyd sat by her favorite window, sewing, twitching her thread less decidedly than usual and casting a wistful glance now and then down the road or at the bees in her gay little garden outside. There was a grim expression overshadowing her firmly set angular face and the frown that always appeared on her forehead when she sewed or read the newspaper was deeper and straighter than usual. She did not look as if she were conscious of the heat though she had dressed herself in an old-fashioned skirt of sprigged lawn, a fine combed cloth, and a loose jacket of thin white dimity. Now that's a sheer cotton fabric with out-of-date flowing sleeves. Her sandy hair was smoothly brushed one lock betrayed a slight crinkle at its edge, but it owed nothing to any encouragement of Nancy Floyd's. Now, Nancy was a nickname for Anne in the 1800s. A hard, honest, kindly face, this was, of a woman whom everybody trusted, who might be expected to give of whatever she had to give, good measure, pressed down, and running over. She was a lonely soul. She had no near relatives in the world. 
It seemed always as if nature had been mistaken in not planting her somewhere in a large and busy household. The little square room, kitchen in winter and sitting room in summer, was as clean and bare and thrifty as one would expect the dwelling place of such a woman to be. She sat in a straight-backed, splint-bottomed chair and always put her spool with a click on the very same spot on the windowsill. Now you would think she had done with youth and with love affairs. Yet, well, you might as well expect the ancient cherry tree in the corner of her yard to cease adventuring its white blossoms when the May sun shone. No woman in Walpole had more bravely and patiently borne the burden of loneliness and the lack of love. Even now, her outward behavior gave no hint of the new excitement and delight that filled her heart. Well, land sakes alive, she says to herself presently. There comes Jerry Lane. I expect if he sees me settin' to the window, he'll come in and dawdle round till supper time. But good Nancy Floyd smooths her hair hastily as she rises and drops her work and steps back toward the middle of the room, watching the gate anxiously all the time. Now, Jerry with a crestfallen look at the vacant window, makes believe that he is going by and takes a loitering step or two onward and then stops short with a somewhat sheepish smile as he leans over the neat picket fence and examines the blue and white and pink larkspur that covers most of the space in the little garden. He takes off his hat again to cool his forehead and replaces it without a grand gesture this time, and looks again at the window, hopefully. There is a pause. The woman knows that the man is sure she is there. A little blush colors her thin cheeks as she comes boldly to the wide-open front door. Hmm. What what do you think of this kind of weather? Asks Jerry, complacently, as he leans over the fence and surrounds himself with an air of self-sacrifice. I call it hot, responds the Juliet from her balcony with deliberate assurance. But the corn needs sun, everybody says. I shouldn't have wanted to toil up from the shore under such a glare if I'd been you. Uh, You better come in and set a while and cool off, she added, without any apparent enthusiasm. Well, Jerry was sure to come anyway. She would rather make the suggestion than have him. Mr. Lane sauntered in and seated himself opposite his hostess, beside the other small window, and watched her admiringly as she took up her sewing and worked at it with great spirit and purpose. He clasped his hands together and leaned forward a little. The shaded kitchen was very comfortable after the glaring light outside and the clean orderliness of the few chairs and the braided rugs and the table under the clock with some larkspur and asparagus in a china vase for decoration seemed to please him unexpectedly. Now, just see what ways you women folks have of fixing things up smart, he ventured gallantly. Nancy's countenance did not forbid further compliment. She looked at the flowers herself quickly and explained that She had gathered them a while ago to send to the minister's sister, who kept house for him, 
I saw him going by and expected he'd be back this same road. Miss Elton's been having another of her dying spells this noon, and the deacon went by after him, hot foot. Oh, I'd souse her well with stone-cold water. <laughs> she never sent for me to set up with her. She knows better. Oh, poor man. "'Twas likely he was right in the middle of tomorrow's sermon. "'Tain't considerate of the deacon, "'and when he knows he's got a fool for a wife, "'he needn't go round persuading other folks "'she's so suffering as she makes out. "'Well, they ain't got no larkspur this year to the parsonage, "'and I was going to let the minister take this over to Amandy. "'But I see his wagon over on the other road.' going towards the village, about an hour after he went by here. It seemed to be a relief to tell somebody all these things after such a season of forced repression, and Jerry listened with gratifying interest. Well, how you do see through folks, he exclaimed in a mild voice. Jerry could be very soft-spoken, if he thought best. Miss Elton, a die-away looking creature. I heard of her saying last Sunday, coming out of meeting, that she had made an effort to get there once more. But she expected it would be the last time. Well, it looks, it looks as if she eat well. Don't she? He concluded in a meditative tone. Eat! exclaimed the hostess with snapping eyes. Oh, there ain't no woman in town, sick or well, can lay aside the food that she does. Taint to the table afore folks, no, but she goes seeking round in the cupboards half a dozen times a day. And I've heard her remark... "'Twas the last time she ever expected to visit the sanctuary "'as much as a dozen times within five years. Eh, "'Some places I've sailed to, "'they'd have hit her over the head with a club long ago,' said Jerry, "'with an utter lack of sympathy that was startling. "'Well, I uh, must be getting back again.' Talking of eating makes us think of supper time. It must be past five o'clock, ain't it? I thought I'd just step up to see if there weren't anything I could lend a hand about this hot day. Sensible Anne Floyd folded her hands over her sewing as it lay in her lap and looked straight before her without seeing the pleading face of the guest. This moment was a great crisis in her life. And she was conscious of it and knew well enough that upon her next words would depend the course of future events. The man who waited to hear what she had to say was, indeed, many years younger than she, was shiftless and vacillating. Oh, he had drifted to Walpole from nobody knew where and possessed many qualities that she had openly rebuked and despised in other men. Mm, true enough, he was good-looking, but that did not atone for the lacks of his character and reputation. Yet she knew herself to be the better man of the two, and since she had surmounted many obstacles already, she was confident that, ah, with a push here and a pull there to steady him, she could keep him in good trim. The winters were so long and lonely. Her life was in many ways 
hungry and desolate, in spite of its thrift and conformity. She had laughed scornfully when he stopped one day last spring and offered to help her weed her garden. Oh, she'd even joked with one of the neighbors about it. Jerry had been growing more and more friendly and pleasant ever since. His ease-loving, careless nature was like a comfortable cushion for hers with its angles, its melancholy anticipations and self-questionings. But Jerry liked her, and if she liked him and married him and took him home, well, it was nobody's business. And in that moment of surrender to Jerry's cause, she arrayed herself at his right hand against the rest of the world, ready for warfare with any and all of its opinions. She was suddenly aware of the sunburnt face and light curling hair of her undeclared lover at the other end of the painted table with its folded leaf. She smiled at him vacantly across the larkspur Ooh, and then gave a little start and was afraid that her thoughts had wandered longer than was seemly. The kitchen clock was ticking faster than usual, as if it were trying to attract attention. Hmm. Well, I, um, guess I'll be getting home, repeated the visitor ruefully, and rose from his chair, but hesitated again, at an unfamiliar expression upon his companion's face. <sighs> well, I don't know as I've got anything extra for supper, but you stop, she said, and take what there is. I wouldn't go back across them marshes right in this heat. Jerry Lane had a lively sense of humor and a queer feeling of merriment stole over him now. As he watched the mistress of the house, oh, she had risen too. She looked so simple and so frankly sentimental. There was such an incongruous coyness added to her usually straightforward, angular appearance, oh, that his instinctive laughter nearly got the better of him and might have lost him the prize for which he'd been waiting these many months. But Jerry behaved like a man. <clears throat> he stepped forward and kissed Anne Floyd. He held her fast with one arm as he stood beside her and kissed her again and again. Well, she was a dear, good woman, and she had a fresh, young heart in spite of the straight wrinkle in her forehead and her work-worn hands. She had waited all her days for this joy of having a lover. Mrs. Elton revived for a day or two under the tonic of such a piece of news. That was what Jerry Lane had hung round for all summer. Everybody knew at last. Now he would strike work and live at his ease, the man grumbled to each other. But all the women of Walpole deplored most the weaknesses and foolishness of the elderly bride. Anne Floyd was comfortably off, 
and had something laid by for a rainy day. Oh, she would have done vastly better to deny herself such an expensive and utterly worthless luxury as the kind of husband Jerry Lane would make. He had idled away his life. Oh, he earned a little money now and then in seafaring pursuits, but was too lazy, in shore parlance, to tend lobster pots. What was energetic Anne Floyd going to do with him? She was always at work, always equal to emergencies, and entirely opposed to dullness and idleness and even placidity. She liked people who had some snap to them, she often avowed, scornfully. And now she had chosen for a husband the laziest man in Walpole. Oh, dear sakes, one woman said to another as they heard the news. Oh, there's no fool like an old fool. The days went quickly by while Miss Anne made her plain wedding clothes. If people expected her to put on airs of youth, they were disappointed. Her wedding bonnet was the same sort of bonnet she had worn for a dozen years. And one disappointed critic deplored the fact that she had spruced up so little and kept on dressing old enough to look like Jerry Lane's mother. As her acquaintances met her, they looked at her with close scrutiny, expecting to see some outward trace of such a silly, uncharacteristic departure from good sense and discretion. But Miss Floyd, while she was still Miss Floyd, displayed no silliness and behaved with dignity. While on the Sunday after a quiet marriage at the parsonage, she and Jerry Lane walked up the side aisle to their pew. The picture of middle-aged sobriety and respectability. Their fellow parishioners, having recovered from their first astonishment and amusement, settled down to the belief that the newly married pair understood their own business best, and that if anybody could make the best of Jerry and get any work out of him, it was his capable wife. And if she undertakes to drive him too hard, <laughs> he can slip off to sea, and they'll be rid of each other, commented one of Jerry's longshore companions, as if it were only reasonable that some refuge should be afforded to those who make mistakes in matrimony. There did not seem to be any mistakes at first, or for a good many months afterward. The husband liked the comfort that came from such good housekeeping and enjoyed a deep sense of having made a good anchorage in a well-sheltered harbor. After many years of thriftless improvidence and drifting to and fro, there were some hindrances to perfect happiness. He had to forego long seasons of gossip with his particular friends, and the outdoor work which was expected of him, though by no means heavy for a person of his strength, fettered his freedom not a little to chop wood and take care of a cow and bring a pail of water now and then did not weary him so much as it made him practically understand the truth of weekly Sister Elton's remark that life was a constant chore. And when poor Jerry, for lack of other interest, fancied that his health was giving way mysteriously and brought home a bottle of strong liquor 
to be used in case of sickness, and placed it, conveniently, in the shed. Mrs. Lane locked it up in the small chimney cupboard, where she kept her camphor bottle and her opadel dock, that's liniment, and other family medicines. She was not harsh with her husband. She cherished him tenderly and worked diligently at her trade of tailoress, singing her hymns gaily in summer weather, for she never had been so happy as now when there was somebody to please beside herself, to cook for and sew for and to live with and love. But Jerry complained more and more in his inmost heart that his wife expected too much of him. Presently, he resumed an old habit of resorting to the least respected of the two country stores of that neighborhood and sat in the row of loafers on the outer steps. Oh, sakes alive, said a shrewd observer one day. The fools sit there and talk and talk about what they went through when they followed the sea. Till when the women folks comes trading, they are obliged to climb right over them. Things grew worse and worse until one day Jerry Lane came home a little late to dinner and found his wife unusually grim-faced and impatient. He took a seat with an amiable smile and showed in every way his determination not to lose his temper because somebody else had. It was one of the days when he looked almost boyish and entirely irresponsible. Oh, his hair was handsome and curly from the dampness of the east wind, and his wife was forced to remember how, in the days of their courtship, she used to wish that she could pull one of the curling locks straight, just for the pleasure of seeing it fly back. She felt old and tired and was hurt in her very soul by the contrast between herself and her husband. Well, no wonder I'm aging, having to lug everything on my shoulders, she thought. Jerry had forgotten to do whatever she had asked him to do for a day or two. He had started out that morning to go lobstering, but he returned from the direction of the village. Nancy, he said pleasantly after he had begun his dinner, a silent, solitary meal, while his wife stitched busily by the window and refused to look at him. Nancy, I've been thinking a good deal about a project. Huh. I hope it ain't going to cost so much and bring in so little as your other notions have then, she responded quickly, though somehow a memory of the hot day when Jerry came and stood outside the window and kissed her when it was settled he should stay to supper. A memory of that day would keep fading and brightening in her mind. Yes, said Jerry humbly. I ain't done right, Nancy. I ain't done my part for our living. I've I've let it sag right on to you most ever since we was married. Well, I'm, there was that spell when I was kind of weakly and I had a, a pain across me. I tell you what it is. I, I never was good for nothing ashore. But now I've got my strength up. I'm going to show you what I can do. I'm promised to ship with Cap'n Lowe's brother. Skipper Nathan, that sails out of Eastport in the coasting trade, lumber and so on. I shall get good wages and you shall keep the hole on it, except what I need for clothes. Oh, you needn't be so plaintive, 
said Anne in a sharp voice. You can go if you want to. I have always been able to take care of myself. Oh, and when it comes to maintaining for two, well, that ain't so easy. When you be going? Uh, I, I expected you would be sorry, mourned Jerry, his face falling at this outbreak. Nancy, you needn't be so quick. Tain't as if I hadn't always said everything by you, if I be worthless. Nancy's eyes flashed fire as she turned hastily away. Hardly knowing where she went, she passed through the open doorway and crossed the clean, green turf of the narrow side yard and leaned over the garden fence. Oh, the young cabbages and cucumbers were nearly buried in weeds, and the currant bushes were fast being turned into skeletons by the ravaging worms. Jerry had forgotten to sprinkle them with hellebore, a plant used as a poison. After all, though she had put the watering pot in his very hand the evening before, she did not like to have the whole town laugh at her for hiring a man to do his work. She was busy from early morning until late night. She could not do everything herself. She'd been a fool to marry this man, she told herself at last, and a sullen discontent and rage that had been of slow but certain growth made her long to free herself from this unprofitable hindrance for a time, at any rate. Go to sea? Yes! That was the best thing that could happen. Perhaps when he had worked hard a while on schooner fare, he would come home and be good for something. Jerry finished his dinner in the course of time and then sought his wife. It was not like her to go away in this silent fashion. Of late, her gift of speech had proved sufficiently formidable, and yet, she had never looked so resolutely angry as today. Nancy, he began. Nancy, girl, I ain't going off to leave you if your heart's set against it. I'll spudge up, move slowly, and take right hold. But the wife turned slowly from the fence and faced him. Her eyes looked as if she'd been crying. You needn't stay on my account, she said. I'll go right to work and fit you out. I'm sick of your meech and talk, whining. And I don't want to hear no more of it. Oh, if I was a man. Jerry Lane looked crestfallen. Mm, for a minute or two. But when his stern partner in life had disappeared within the house, ah, he slunk away among the apple trees of the little orchard and sat down on the grass in a shady spot. Oof. It was getting to be warm weather, uh, but he would go round and hoe the old girl's garden stuff by and by. Hmm. There would be something going on aboard the schooner. And with delicious anticipation of future pleasure, this Delinquent Jerry struck his knee with his hand as if he were clapping a crony on the shoulder. He also winked several times at the fancied companion. Then, with a comfortable chuckle, he laid himself down, pulled his old hat over his eyes, and went to sleep while the weeds grew at their own sweet will, and the current worms went looping and devouring from twig to twig. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Part 
three. Summer went by, and winter began, and Mr. Jerry Lane did not reappear. He had promised to return in September, when he parted from his wife early in June, for Nancy had relented a little at the last, and sorrowed at the prospect of so long a separation. She had already learned the vacillations and uncertainties of her husband's character. But though she accepted the truth that her marriage had been in every way a, a piece of foolishness, she still clung affectionately to his assumed fondness for her. She could not believe that his marriage was only one of his makeshifts, and that as soon as he grew tired of the constraint, he was ready to throw the benefits of respectable home life to the four winds. A little sentimental speech-making and a few kisses the morning he went. And the gratitude he might well have shown for her generous caretaking and provision for his voyage won her soft heart back again and made poor, elderly, simple-hearted Nancy watch him cross the marshes with tears and foreboding. If she could have called him back that day, she would have done so and been thankful. And all summer and winter when the wind blew and thrashed the drooping elm boughs, against the low roof over her head. She was full of fears and anxieties, as if Jerry were her only son and making his first voyage at sea. The neighbors pitied her for her disappointment. Oh, they liked Nancy, but they could not help saying, I told you so. It would have been impossible not to respect the brave way in which she met the world's eye and carried herself with innocent unconsciousness of having committed so laughable and unrewarding a folly. The loafers on the store steps had been unwantedly diverted one day when Jerry, who was their chief wit and spokesman then, rose slowly from his place and said in pious tones, Boys, I must go this minute. Grandma will keep dinner waiting. Mrs. Ann Lane did not show in her aging face how young her heart was. And after the schooner Susan Barnes had departed, she seemed to pass swiftly from middle life and an almost youthful vigor to early age and a look of spent strength and dissatisfaction. Oh, I suppose he did find it dull, she assured herself with wistful yearning for his rough words of praise when she sat down alone to her dinner or looked up sadly from her work and missed the amusing, though unedifying, conversation he was wont to offer occasionally on stormy winter nights. <laughs> How much of his adventuring was true, oh, she never cared to ask. He had come and gone and she forgave him his shortcomings and longed for his society with a heavy heart. One spring day, there was news in the Boston paper of the loss of the schooner Susan Barnes with all on board and Nancy Lane's best friends shook their sage heads and declared that as far as regarded Jerry Lane, that idle vagabond, it was all for the best. Nobody was interested in any other member of the crew, so the misfortune of the Susan Barnes seemed of but slight consequence in Walpole. She, 
she having passed out of her former owner's hands the autumn before. Jerry had stuck by the ship. At least, so he had sent word then to his wife by Skipper Nathan Lowe. The Susan Barnes was to sail regularly from Shediac and Newfoundland. And Jerry sent five dollars to Nancy and promised to pay her a visit soon. Uh, Tell her I'm laying up something handsome, he told the skipper with a grin. And I've got some folks in Newfoundland I'll visit on this voyage, and then I'll come ashore for good and farm it. Mrs. Lane took the five dollars from the skipper as proudly as if Jerry had done the same thing so many times before that she hardly noticed it. The skipper gave the messages from Jerry and felt that he had done the proper thing. When the news came long afterward that the schooner was lost, that was the next thing that Nancy knew about her wandering mate. And after the minister had come solemnly to inform her of her bereavement and had gone away again, and she sat down and looked her widowhood in the face, there was not a sadder nor a lonelier woman in the town of Walpole. All the neighbors came to condole with our heroine, and though nobody was aware of it from that time, she was really happier and better satisfied with life than she had ever been before. Now, she had an ideal Jerry Lane to mourn over and think about, to cherish and admire. She was day by day slowly forgetting the trouble he had been and the bitter shame of him and exalting his memory to something near saintliness. He meant well, she told herself again and again. She thought nobody could tell so good a story. She felt it with her own bustling, capable ways. Well, he had no chance to do much that he might have done. She had been too quick with him. And alas, alas, how much better she would know how to treat him if only she could see him again. A sense of relief at his absence made her continually assure herself of her great loss and faults even to herself. She mourned her sometime lover diligently and tried to think herself a broken-hearted woman. It was thought among those who knew Nancy Lane best that she would recover her spirits in time. But Jerry's wildest anticipations of a proper respect to his memory were more than realized in the first two years after the schooner Susan Barnes went to the bottom of the sea. She mourned for her man. She mourned for the man he ought to have been. Not the real Jerry. But she had loved him in the beginning enough to make her own love a precious possession for all time to come. It did not matter much, after all, what manner of man he was. She had found in him something on which to spend her hoarded affection. Nancy Lane was a peaceable woman and a good neighbor, but she never had been able to get on with one fellow townswoman, and that was Mrs. Deacon 
Elton. Oh, they managed to keep each other provoked and teased from one year's end to the other. And each good soul felt herself under a moral microscope and understood that she was judged by a not very lenient criticism and discussion. Mrs. Lane clad herself in simple black after the news came of her husband's timely death. And Mrs. Elton made one of her farewell pilgrimages to church to see the new-made widow walk up the aisle. Uh, she needn't tell me she lays that affliction so much to heart, the deacon's wife sniffed faintly, after her exhaustion had been met by proper treatment of camphor and a glass of currant wine at the parsonage, where she rested a while after service. Nancy Floyd <laughs> knows she's well over with such a piece of nonsense. Well, if I had had my rest a while, I and my health, I... I should have spoken with her and urged her not to take the step in the first place. Well, she hasn't spoken six beholden words to me since that vagabond come to Walpole. I dare say she may have heard something I said at the time she married. Well, I declare for it, I never was so outdone as I was when the deacon came home and told me Nancy Floyd was going to be married. Well, she let herself down too low to ever hold the place again that she used to have in folks' minds. And it's my opinion, said the sharp-eyed little woman, she ain't got through with her pay yet. Mrs. Elton did not half know with what unconscious prophecy her words were freighted. The months passed by. Summer and winter came and went, and even those persons who were misled by Nancy Lane's stern visage and forbidding exterior into forgetting her kind heart were at last won over to friendliness by her renewed devotion to the sick and old people of the rural community. Oh, she was so tender to little children that they all loved her dearly. She was ready to go to any household that needed help, and in spite of her ceaseless industry with her needle, she found many a chance to do good and help her neighbors to lift and carry the burdens of their lives. She blossomed out suddenly into a lovely, painstaking eagerness to be of use. It seemed as if her affectionate heart once made generous, must go on spending its wealth wherever it could find an excuse. Even Mrs. Elton herself was touched by her old enemy's evident wish to be friends and said nothing more about poor Nancy's looking as savage as a hawk. The only thing to admit was the truth that her affliction had proved to be a blessing to her, and it was in a truly kind and compassionate spirit that, after hearing a piece of news, the deacon's hysterical wife forbore to spread it far and wide through the town first, and went down to the widow Lane's one September afternoon. Nancy was stitching busily upon the deacon's new coat and looked up with a friendly smile as her guest came in. In spite of an instinctive shrug as she had seen her coming up the yard, oh, the dislike of the poor souls for each other was deeper than their philosophy could reach. Mrs. Elton spent some minutes in the unnecessary endeavor to regain her breath and to her surprise found she must make a real effort before she could tell her unwelcome news. 
Oh, she'd been so full of it all the way from home that she had rehearsed the whole interview. Now, she hardly knew how to begin. Nancy looked serener than usual, but there was something wistful about her face as she glanced across the room presently, as if to understand the reason for the long pause. The clock ticked loudly. The kitten clattered a spool against the table leg and had begun to snarl the thread round her busy paws, and Nancy looked down and saw her. And then the instant consciousness of there being some unhappy reason for Mrs. Elton's call made her forget the creature's mischief and anxiously lay down her work to listen. Skipper Nancy, Skipper Nathan Lowe was to our house to dinner, the guest began. Oh, yes. He's bargaining with the deacon about some hay. Oh, he's got a new schooner, Skipper Nathan has, and it's going to build up a regular business of freighting hay to Boston by sea. Well, there's no market to speak of about here unless you haul it way over to Downer and you can't make but one turn a day. Hmm, it would be a good thing, replied Nancy, trying to think that this was all. And perhaps the deacon wanted to hire her own field another year. He had underpaid her once, and they had not been on particularly good terms ever since. Hmm. She would make her own bargains with Skipper Nathan, she thanked him and his wife. Well, he's been down to the provinces these two or three years back, you know the whining voice went on, and straightforward Anne Lane felt the old animosity rising within her. At dinner time, well, I wasn't able to eat much of anything, and so I was talking with Cap'n Nathan and asking him some questions about them parts, and I spoke something about the mercy it was that his life should have been spared when that schooner, the Susan Barnes, was lost so quick after he sold out his part of her. Oh, and I put in a word, being as we were neighbors, about how edifying your course had been under affliction. And I, I noticed then he looked sort of queer while I was talking. But, well... There was all the folks to the table, and you know, he's a very cautious man, so he spoke of something else. Well, twasn't half an hour after dinner, I was coming in with some plates and cups, trying to help what my strength would let me, and says he, oh, Step out a little ways into the peace with me, Miss Elton. I want to have a word with you. Well, I went to, spite of my neuralgia, for I saw he got something on his mind. Now look here, says he. I gathered from the way you spoke that Jerry Lane's wife expects he's dead. Well, certain, says I. His name was in the list of the Susan Barnes crew, and well, we all read it in the paper. No, says he to me. He ran away the day they sailed. He wasn't bored, and he's living with... He's living with another woman down to Shediac. Them were his very words. Nancy Lane sank back in her chair and covered her horror-stricken eyes with her hands. Now, it ain't pleasant news to have to tell, Sister Elton went on mildly, yet with evident relish and full command of the occasion. He said he seen Jerry the morning he came away, when I thought you ought to know it. I'll tell you one thing, Nancy. I told the skipper to keep still about it. 
And now I've told you, I won't spread it no further to set folks a talking. I'll keep it a secret till you say the word. There ain't much traffic in betwixt here and there, and he's dead to you certain as much as if he laid up here in the burying ground. Nancy had bowed her head upon the table. The thin sandy hair was streaked with gray. She did not answer one word. This was the hardest blow of all. Uh, I'm much obliged to you for being so friendly, she said after a few minutes looking straight before her now in a dazed sort of way and lifting the new coat from the floor where it had fallen. Yes. He's dead to me. Worse than dead. A good deal. And her lip quivered. I... I can't seem to bring my thoughts to bear. I've got so used to thinking... No, don't you say nothing to the folks yet. I'd, I'd do as much for you. And Mrs. Elton knew that the smitten fellow creature before her spoke the truth and forbore. Two or three days came and went, and with every hour, the quiet, simple-hearted woman felt more grieved and unsteady in mind and body. Such a shattering thunderbolt of news rarely falls into human life. She could not sleep. She wandered to and fro in the little house and cried until she could cry no longer. And then a great rage spurred and excited her she would go to Shediac and call Jerry Lane to account. She would accuse him face to face, and the woman whom he was deceiving, as perhaps he had deceived her, should know the baseness and cowardice of this miserable man. So, dressed in her respectable Sunday clothes, in the gray bonnet and the shawl that never had known any journeys, except a meeting or a country funeral or quiet holiday making, Nancy Lane trusted herself for the first time to the bewildering railway, to the temptations and dangers of the wide world outside the bounds of Walpole. Two or three days later still, the quaint, thin figure, familiar in Walpole highways, flitted down the street of a provincial town. In the most primitive region of China, this woman could hardly have felt a greater sense of foreign life and strangeness. At another time, her native good sense and shrewd observation would have delighted in the experiences of this first week of travel. But she was too sternly angry and aggrieved, too deeply plunged in a survey of her own calamity, to take much notice of what was going on about her. Oh, later, she condemned the unworthy folly of the whole errand. But in these days, the impulse to seek the culprit and confront him was irresistible. The innkeeper's wife, a kindly creature, urged this puzzling guest to wait and rest and eat some supper. But Nancy refused and without asking her way, left the brightly lighted, flaring little public room where curious eyes already offended her and went out into the damp twilight. 
the voices of the street boys sounded outlandish, and she felt more and more lonely. She longed for Jerry to appear, for protection's sake. She forgot why she sought him and was eager to shelter herself behind the flimsy bulwark of his manhood. She rebuked herself presently with terrible bitterness for a womanish wonder whether he would say, Why, Nancy girl, and be glad to see her. Poor woman, it was a work laden, serious girlhood that had been hers at any rate. The power of giving her whole self in unselfish, enthusiastic, patient devotion had not belonged to her youth only. It had sprung fresh and blossoming in her heart as every new year came and went. One might have seen her stealing through the shadows, skirting the edge of a lumber yard, stepping among the refuse of the harbor side, asking a question timidly now and then of some passerby. Oh yes, they knew Jerry Lane. His house was only a little way off. And one curious and compassionate Scotchman, divining by some inner sense the exciting nature of the errand, turned back and offered, fruitlessly, to go with the stranger. You know the man? he asked. Oh, he's his own enemy, oh, but doing better now that he's married. He minds his work, I know that well, but he's taken a good wife. Nancy's heart beat faster with honest pride for a moment, until the shadow of the ugly truth and reality made it sink back to heaviness and the fire of her smoldering rage was again kindled. She would speak to Jerry face to face before she slept, and a horrible contempt and scorn were ready for him, as, with a glance either way along the road, she entered the narrow yard and went noiselessly toward the window of a low, poor-looking house from whence a bright light was shining out into the night. Yes, there was Jerry, and it seemed as if she must faint and fall at the sight of him. How young he looked still. The thought smote her like a blow. Hey, Never were mates for each other, Jerry and she. Her own life was waning. She was an old woman. He never had been so thrifty and respectable before. Well, the other woman ought to know the savage truth about him for all that. But at that moment, the other woman stooped beside the supper table and lifted a baby from its cradle and put the dear live little thing into its father's arms. The baby was wide awake and laughed at Jerry, who laughed back again, and it reached up to catch a handful of the curly hair which had been poor Nancy's delight. The other woman stood there looking at them, full of pride and love. She was young and trig, smart and neat. She looked a brisk, efficient little creature. Well, perhaps Jerry would make something of himself now. He always had it in him. The tears were running down Nancy's cheeks. The rain, too, had begun to fall. She stood there, watching the little household sit down to supper and noticed with eager envy how well cooked the food was and how hungrily the master of the house ate what was put before him. All thoughts of ending the new wife's 
sin and folly vanished away. She could not enter in and break another heart. Hers was broken already, and it would not matter. And Nancy Lane, a widow indeed, crept away again as silently as she had come to think what was best to be done to find alternate woe and comfort in the memory of the sight she had seen. The little house at the edge of the Walpole marshes seemed full of blessed shelter and comfort the evening that its forsaken mistress came back to it. Her strength was spent. She felt much more desolate now that she had seen with her own eyes that Jerry Lane was alive than when he was counted among the dead. An uncharacteristic disregard of the laws of the land filled this good woman's mind. Ah, Jerry had his life to live, and she wished him no harm. She wondered often how the baby grew. She fancied sometime the changes and conditions of the faraway household. Alas, she knew only too well the weakness of the man. And once, in a grim outburst of impatience, she exclaimed, I'd rather others should have to cope with him than me. But that evening when she came back from Shediac and sat in the dark for a long time, lest Mrs. Elton should see the light and risk her life in the evening air to bring unwelcome sympathy, that evening, I say, came the hardest moment of all, when the Anne Floyd, tailoress of so many virtuous, self-respecting years, whose idol had turned to clay, who was shamed, disgraced, and wronged, sat down alone to supper in the little kitchen. She had put one cup and saucer on the table. She looked at them through bitter tears. Somehow a consciousness of her solitary age, her uncompanioned future rushed through her mind. This failure of her best earthly hope was enough to break a stronger woman's heart. Who can laugh at my marsh rosemary? Or who can cry, for that matter? The gray primness of the plant is made up of a hundred colors if you look close enough to find them. This same marsh rosemary stands in her own place and holds her dry leaves and tiny blossoms steadily toward the same sun that the pink lotus blooms for the white rose. Our introduction information this week came from Sarah Orne Jewett, esteemed New England author by Nava Atlas for The Literary Lady's Guide and other sources in our show notes. Our music for this episode is Koliskova by Alexei Zorovic and Calm Chords by Kyle Davies and Soft by Kat Nicholas. You can reach me at Fast Asleep with Gina Marie 44 at Gmail.
www.thepodcastmusicgroup.com. Or you can find us on Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok. And please, keep us here for you as you comment, like, and subscribe to Fast Asleep with Gina Marie. I thank you for listening. Keyword. Oh, and it's another word for Marsh Rosemary. It's lavender. <laughs>